Welcome to the Center for Global Enterprise, Global Scholars, Expert Connect series, Identity in a Digital World. My name is Iris Sager. I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise. For those of you new to the Center for Global Enterprise and our Global Scholars program, CG is a nonprofit research institute focused on the study of global management best practices, the, manage, uh, the modern corporation, economic integration, and their impact on society. Our Global Scholars Program is a worldwide learning community for business interested students, academic faculty, and business professionals. Through Global Scholars, we offer online courses and digital internships, as well as this and other expert connects. Participation in all our uh, programs and membership is free. You can find more information about our activities on the CGE website. But before we start, a few housekeeping chores. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on demand via the CGE YouTube channel. We will leave approximately 15 minutes at the end of this uh, session for audience questions. If you have a question for our panelists, you can submit your question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to get to all your questions, time permitting. Today's session on India's ad hoc digital ID program is the second forum we've convened to explore the complex issues surrounding how we manage the security and privacy of our identity in an increasingly digital world. CGE launched this forum to showcase the leading edge, practical and applied learning on the topic of digital identity and the implications for business and management. Today's focus on India's ad hoc program couldn't be more timely. India's Supreme Court just ruled that the biometric program, the first and largest digital identity system implemented on a national scale, can continue to collect data of its citizens, but it placed new regulations on the balance between identity management and data privacy, a ruling that is likely to have a big impact on countries around the world. Leading our discussion is Dr. Irving Gladowski Berger, a CD, CGE fellow and former IBM Vice President of Technical Strategy and Innovation, who will introduce today's presenter, Dr. Ram Siwak Sharma, the founding CEO of India's Adhar ID project. Irving. Thank you, Ira, and welcome everybody to our webinar. It is truly an honor for me to introduce Dr. R.S. Sharma, the chairman of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, a position that he has held since August of 2015. In his present job, Dr. Sharma has led major reforms in the sector, including the work in the area of net neutrality, data ownership, privacy, and security. Dr. Sharma has been working in the area of public administration over the last 40 years and has long been deeply involved in the areas of e-governance and the delivery of public services in India. But very prominently, and the subject of today's webinar, Dr. Sharma was Director General and Mission Director of the Unique Identification Authority of India as a founding CEO for India's ID project called Adhar. He was the head of it from 2009 to 2013. I've been following Adhar very closely since the beginning because it's such a fascinating project uh, with the scope and, and all the things that it's been doing. And because clearly, the Indian government has been a true pioneer in the question of identity management. And as Ira Sager just said, the India Supreme Court just made an incredibly important ruling on the balance between identity management and privacy, a ruling that as I read in today's New York Times, as I was having my breakfast this morning, is going to have a huge influence, not only in India, but in countries around the world. Dr. Sharma, also a PhD from IIT Delhi, 
a master's in computer sciences from University of California at Riverside, and a master's in mathematics from IIT Kanpur. Dr. Sharma, it's a pleasure to have you, and we look forward to your webinar. Thank you very much, uh, friends, and I really feel uh, privileged and honored to be talking to you and on this platform. I have always believed that if something good has been done somewhere, it must be shared with everybody in the world and so that you know, other people do not reinvent the wheel. And the whole purpose of talking about this project is essentially to spread that message and essentially to share our experiences. The idea is not that these experiences can be exactly replicated as they are, but the idea is that something good can be taken out of these experiences and probably modified in the national context and then, then kind of replicated in each country or each domain. So that's the whole purpose. I'm not sure how much time do I have to, to uh, you know, present. Just tell me that and then I'll, I'll, I'll proceed further from there. Oh, we have about uh, 20 minutes for your presentation. And then we'd like you to have a discussion with Irving and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'll try to keep uh, this timeline. So the idea is again, as you know, I was mentioning yesterday, the Supreme Court of India, uh, you know, kind of gave a thumping uh, ruling saying that, look, Aadhaar as an artifact, as a product, as a digital identity infrastructure, follows all the principles of privacy preservation, security, and you know, all, all data privacy and, and other uh, you know, uh, best practices in the digital world. And also it actually gives empowerment to the poor and marginalized of this country. And, and therefore it's a, it's a wonderful judgment. And personally, for all of us who worked in Aadha uh, on this project, we have been completely you know, celebrating since last, uh, last evening. So, so, so I think this, this presentation would not have come at a more opportunate time. So it has been validated to be uh, uh, something. Uh, the architecture and the design of this project has been validated to be consistent and in consonance with the broad principles of right to privacy being a fundamental right. So let me just now, now uh, go to the next uh, slide. So essentially, the, the, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk quickly about some of these stuff as to why did we start Aadhaar? Why did we start this digital ID project in India? So context, what are the context? And then how did we begin doing it? What are the design principles? And why does Aadhaar become such an important tool of service delivery? And what are the products which we have built on top of Aadhaar and what have been our experiences thus far? That's the broad, broad agenda. So going to the next slide, uh, essentially, there were two problems which we had in India. One was there were many people who did not have any formal identity document. Now, to those who are from, let's say, Western Europe or some other developed countries, they may not understand and appreciate this specific aspect that how can there be a, a born, I mean, as soon as a child is born, you know, some national document or some kind of document is given, birth certificates, etc. How is it that some people may not have any ID document in a country? But that was the case with us, where we had, you know, large number of people who do not have any documents which they could use to present before any formal system to do any transaction. So, for example, if I wanted to open a bank account, I probably did not have any document to prove my existence. And that was one problem which we were trying to solve, which means can we develop an identity system which is inclusive, which means it's not, it's not difficult for a person to get an ID. So that's one context. The other context was that while many people did not have any ID, there were some other people who had multiple IDs. And the idea was because India was giving subsidies and benefits to individuals, it was beneficial to gain the system by having multiple IDs. 
So that's that's another part. So essentially, to clean up existing databases from ghosts and duplicates, there were multiple ghosts and duplicates existing in various databases. So how do we create an ID system which can ensure uniqueness in the sense that one person only gets one identity? So put it this way: uniqueness and inclusion were the twin goals with which which we were trying to you know, solve these two problems. And of course, a corollary of this, these two objectives was to improve targeting and delivery of services because if you have an identity, then you can target these services to an individual. And of course, if you have a digital identity, then the digital delivery of services is almost always cheaper than the physical delivery of services with documents and photocopies and stuff like that. And that's another part. So these are the four you know, context in some sense, which you see on this slide. Next. So essentially, uh, what was, one was the problem statement. Second was, what were the overarching, you know, constraints or objectives which we had? One was uniqueness, I explained to you. Another was scale and speed. Because if you start creating IDs, and India has got 1.2 billion people. And if you are not speedy enough, if you are not quick enough, it might never finish because the people who get, you know, the number of persons who are born, if your ID system generation has the same rate, then it will go on till infinity. So hence, we had to have some program which could actually ensure a speed. And that our objective was, can we do it 1 million per day? And if we do it 1 million per day, 1.2 million will wait, 1.2 billion will take 1200 days, working days which will mean about four to five years. So, so can we do it that fast? Second, scale. The point is, if you have any program, then does it scale up to that level? So that was another issue which we had. How do we make this process easy? Because inclusion was one of the, one of the goals. And then of course, the bootstrap problem. Bootstrap problem is if I ask for ID document to create ID document, then, you know, I'm running into a circle, circular problem where a person who has no ID document, he can't get an ID document. So that's, that's the bootstrap problem, we call it. Uh, so that was another one. It has to be cost effective. If you see UK's ID program, it was costing, as per London School of Economics study, it was costing about 135 pounds. Now, if we, you know, do that, we will spend trillions of, you know, rupees, trillions of, of dollars, which is, I mean, huge number of dollars, 1.2 billion, multiply that by, by 135, you have a huge figure. We have to be cost effective. We have to use technology to ensure uniqueness. It has to be a future proof, especially when IT systems get obsolete very soon. How do you ensure that the systems are future proof? And of course, we were building a foundational identity, which means this identity is not for a specific purpose. It should be used as a platform for multiple domains. So that was the broad architectural overarching goals with which we begin this program. Next. Now the design choices which we made was essentially, you know, it should be, we, should, we will create de novo data creation. If we, if we base it on some other database, which already is infected with a lot of duplicates and ghosts, we will end up creating another erroneous uh, database. So therefore we said, let's begin de novo. Of course, let's, let's also ensure that we don't use any specialized hardware because this will require a huge processing and we can't, we can't sort of depend on one you know, vendor uh, to, to provide us a specialized hardware. So it should be a commodity hardware. It should be asynchronous, unbundled and minimalistic kind of processes, which means we should not create many dependencies to create this program because you know, if you create dependencies, then, then you know, one thing doesn't happen, then the other thing will just get stopped. So that's another part data driven decision making. We can't depend on anecdotes and stuff like that. So we have to design a system which is based on data driven decision making. Decentralized enrollment, centralized processing, because you can't have a central enrollment process. India is such a diverse country with multiple languages and multiple you know, issues and problems of infrastructure, electricity, power. We can't, so we have to have some system where you are, and, and of course, if you want to provide convenience to people, then you have to have decentralized enrollments. And of course, outcome-based remunerations and open source and open standards. That's very, very important. 
See, we did, did not use, we decided not to use any of the proprietary stuff. So all our systems, op operating systems, communication protocol systems, they were all open source and they were based on open standards. We also use the third thing, which is called open API, because ultimately you are making an interoperable platform and therefore it has to be based on open APIs. Next. So broadly, these are the features of Aadhaar and I'll quickly go through them. One is that, you know, only numbers, we decided to issue only numbers because we believe that in a connected online world, you don't need any tokens. So we did not use any cards, not, neither is smart or non-smart. You know, we just printed the number on a piece of paper and you know, sent it in form of a letter. That, that's how we did. And, and we thought that you know, our whole idea was it's a digital online ID infrastructure and you don't need to use any of the cards. Secondly, the privacy was built in as a design. So we use random numbers and therefore they were, the numbers don't have any profiling or intelligence, which means if the Aadhaar is a 12 digit random number, the 12th digit is a check digit, and therefore there are effectively 11 digits which are operational. And you can, you know, as you know, 11 digits will give you 10 to the power 11 numbers, which is 100 billion. So you will have 100 billion number space, and on this number line, all these are random numbers, so they are spread, and you know, you can't even guess anybody's Aadhaar. So if, if I give you a 12 digit random number, you don't know whether it's an Aadhaar number or not an Aadhaar number. And, and if somebody's Aadhaar number, you know, next number may not be Aadhaar number. In fact, the probability is one in 100. It is voluntary in nature. Enrollment was voluntary. Uh, all residents, including children. So, so biometric was the basis of unique, creating uniqueness. Biometric was collected not because, you know, we wanted to capture everybody's biometric, but there was no other way to ensure that one person only gets one Aadhaar one number because the biometric deduplication fortunately you know nature has created that each person has got unique biometrics and we took all 10 fingerprints in both iris because fingerprints could not have given us accuracy of more than 95 percent and as you know 1.2 billion five percent is 60 million so you know 60 million duplicates would have been you know floating around so we, we actually included iris which actually gave us the accuracy level of 99.98%. So that's the other part. Uh, it, it actually, another part which we ensured that it is just an ID. It did not give any guarantee to citizenship rights entitlement. That's very important because if we would have bogged down to citizenship, then we, it would have been very difficult exercise for us to you know, continue. So we said all residents are entitled. Anybody who's living in India is entitled to four Aadhaar number. And because we just proved this X is X. We said, no, X, what, what X deserves or what X's entitlements are. We are not going into that. So this is the world's first ID in some sense, which is actually ID without eligibility. You know, this is, the, this is a very fundamental principle because typically all the ID documents are essentially eligibility documents. You know, you use, you know, for example, driving license to prove your identity, but driving license is essentially an, an an eligibility document that you know you can drive a vehicle or, or you can you know, passport a citizenship document so they are all eligibility documents these are we we'll build eligibility on top of this identity so basically we just have minimal identity and of course we also started a new thing which nobody in the world had done which is essentially we will provide authentication which means using your biometrics or your demographics you can you know, prove without any document, just by remembering numbers and some of your, you know, identity attributes and, and, and put that, and this, this will basically prove that you are you. So at the service delivery points, you can use this as an authentication mechanism. And this authentication provides ubiquitous services like banking, like mobile, you know, uh, uh, things, like getting ration from the ration shops, subsidized ration, getting the liquid petroleum gas, you know, gas cylinders, cooking gas. So all kinds of, you know, transactions are authenticated and it's important. Otherwise, if you don't authenticate, you may get my, you know, entitlement and that, that becomes a problem. So essentially, in order to ensure that there's no proxy in the service delivery, authentication was introduced. Authentication also brought about another revolution, which is your identity now is on the cloud. 
your authentication or your eligibility in typical domains is also on the cloud. So therefore, your entitlements are all portable. So portability of entitlements is another important attribute which comes out of authentication. So online authentication as a service we provide. And just to give you an idea, you know, we have done, we are doing 8 billion authentications per, per month. So that's the, you know, imagine the amount of authentication which is being done every day. Uh, uh, so, so that's, that's it. Next. This is actually one of the databases which has, uh, you know, grown to about 900, about a billion in five years. So there's no other database in the world, including the private databases, which have grown to 1 billion and especially, you know, biometric database in five years. And that's, that's how it began. The first number we issued in September of 2010. And, and, uh, and, and then of course, by 2015, you had 950 million. And now of course it is saturated. So now you have 1.23 billion uh, by July. And now the rates of uh, increase is very low because now there's only residual population which is being covered. Next. The question arises, why does Aadhaar become so useful? It becomes useful because Aadhaar is unique. And therefore, and the Aadhaar is existential, which means that you can't have Aadhaar, a fake Aadhaar, in the sense that if there is an Aadhaar, there has got to be some person existing. So unique net in existence, they ensure that there are no fakes or duplicates. Then we started a service called uh, Know Your Customer, KYC, and we introduced another concept called electronic KYC. So the way you do your authentication, immediately the Aadhaar authority issues a digitally signed KYC document, which gets deposited in the domain. So for example, if I'm uh, going to get a mobile connection, I'll just authenticate myself and the, the mobile connection company will get my digitally signed document in their database and one can provide a mobile SIM in a paperless manner. Of course, entitlement should reach the beneficiary. So therefore, as I explained to you, non-transferability, which means only I can access my benefits, nobody else can do on my behalf. And this is assured by authentication at the point of service delivery. And many domains are using it as proof of presence. For example, the attendance, you know, in, in, in India, uh, the biometric attendance has been introduced. And today, 4 million people across the country in various government offices, they use biometric attendance. So it's basically a digital attendance. Rather than, you know, piling some attendance on some paper, you just sort of go and, and, and put your finger and, and you are authenticated. And the round trip time of this is less than two seconds. So therefore, Aadhaar is working as an identity platform and it provides a common plugin for various domains. Next. Now, we constructed, you know, we, we all, Indians all believe in what is called Trinity. Our gods are also three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, as they call it, you know, somebody who created somebody who, who, who sort of uh, takes care and somebody who destroys. So similarly, we came up with this concept called Jam. Now Jam is, the J stands for what is called Janathan, which is essentially financial inclusion, because we believe that my, now I'm coming down to the applications of Aadhaar and I think now I have about, about uh, six, seven, eight minutes, so I'll just conclude quickly. So Janathan is essentially the, the you know, financial inclusion and we have opened bank account and 312 million bank accounts were opened in a period of a couple of months using the electronic KYC. The Aadhaar I explained to you and mobile. Today we have 1.2 billion mobile connections in our country. So almost everybody has got a mobile. Now what we have done is we have linked Aadhaar with mobile and therefore we have created what is called a proxy digital identity. So every time you don't have to do biometric authentication, your mobile through OTP becomes another form of authentication. Next. So we have now, we'll have half billion smartphones in, in 2018. The, we are adding 25 billion smartphones every quarter. Next. The authentication services are being used in banking, the delivery of food grains, and, and the cooking gas, proof of presence, you know, uh, huge savings with convenience and traceability. In fact, in parliament itself, one of the finance minister gave his statement that Aadhaar is saving about 
14 billion US dollars every year, about 90,000 crores, as they say, in Indian rupees. Now, that, will, that means that, you know, the total expenditure in Aadhaar is less than one and a half billion. So you can imagine Aadhaar is saving 10 times the amount which has been spent on it every year. Next. So this is actually another part is Aadhaar is now used as a universal financial address, which means I don't have to know the bank account number of an individual. You can change the bank account, but we have created a direct pipe to the individual using his Aadhaar number. We can transfer money. So today the government is transferring 140 million credits per month as the subsidy of the liquid petroleum gas, which is a cooking gas. So imagine 2 billion credit transactions of very small amount, you know, about a dollar each, 50 rupees, 60 rupees. That's taking place today. And this is happening in a digital manner. So actually, it doesn't really put too much of pressure on the system. The banking system is handling it in a very smooth manner. So essentially, government puts in money using an Aadhaar number, and the, the guy can just take it out. Next. There, of course, there are multiple products which we have built on top of Aadhaar, and I think I, we don't really have much time, but let's go. So next, uh, you know, the, the, we have done a number of products on, on top of it. We have done electronic KYC. We have done Aadhaar-enabled payment system. We have done Aadhaar payment bridge. We have something called on-demand digital signature. We call it e-sign because you can prove your identity online, and then, you know, you can just digitally sign in document so you don't need a dongle to you know kind of sign a document then you have digital locker whereby you can keep your documents in a digital locker and you can digitally sign and share these documents it's similar to Dropbox with a difference that you can digitally sign these documents on demand and, and share it so that's that's the fundamental difference a non-reputable uh, you know signatures you can do and, and do it so and then of course we have the unified payment interface which is again based on Aadhaar essentially, which is a digital way, interoperable, interbanking digital way to transfer money. So today you transfer very, very small amount. And the number of UPI transactions has become more than the number of total credit and debit card transactions. Imagine in a couple of years, this was launched about one and a half years back and the numbers have already crossed. So that's one. And of course, uh, consent application architecture, GST and other things which you have done. Next. So essentially, the, the way Aadhaar, how, why does Aadhaar become important? Because it has been designed to, in a manner which is called a, typically an hourglass architecture, which is minimal, standardized, simple design, and easy to write a rule on. So easy to develop products on top of it. Next. So multiple products on top of Aadhaar. Next. It is unique. It's lifetime. We don't use Aadhaar even after, we don't reuse Aadhaar number after the death of a person, which means that because we have 100 billions of them, so we don't need to use this. The number also goes with the person. Next. No more physical presence because of the Aadhaar authentication service. Next. No more photocopies because of the digital KYC. Next. E-sign, essentially I explained to you, this is an online uh, digital signature service and, and it is being provided. Next. Digital lockers also I mentioned to you. Next. Unified payment interface. This is the great you know, ar architecture of this, which actually enables interoperable uh, uh, you know, payments. I, my account may be in bank A, your account may be in bank B. I may have application from X and you can have application from Y and still everything interoperates because of the UPI, unified payment interface, which is a protocol. Next. Electronic consent architecture, this I'll not, I'll not be able to because this basically this is a very unique product to India where you can give, provide a digital consent with all the, you know, it's an artifact where you have time to lay, what are you consenting it. So this, this kind of digital world, it becomes an extremely important, uh, especially in a data privacy kind of situation. Next. So we have this, uh, you know, presenceless layer, paperless layer, cashless layer, consent layer all these products being built uh, on top of it. This is a broad picture of a robust, a scalable, and interoperable low-cost architecture. Next. So we are now having huge amount of transactions, digital transactions, and we feel that, you know, India will, you know, we'll, we may not become rich nation, but we'll certainly become data-rich nation. <laughs> so, so very, very few years. That's, and I think we should be able to 
uh, use this this data for for benefits of our citizens next so a couple of applications about you know loans algorithmically which can be given using the credit history which is a digital footprints so once you have more digital transactions then of course the credit institutions develop confidence in, in that next so the, okay i will just skip through these slides next please yeah so essentially the point is that you know this can be used to provide loans and micro credits to to you know some small uh, people you know they're, they're not even a small enterprise they are actually just individual enterprises individual stuff which which people are doing so they can get access to credit at low rates of interest because the problem the what we call poverty premium is that the more poor you are the more interest you rates you have to pay to get a loan so that's that's actually a paradox situation next yeah go ahead next yeah. go ahead so essentially uh, this is the last concluding uh, slide which is it provides a foundation for a number of innovations and reforms in public service delivery service delivery systems the direct benefit transfer which means using aadhaar as a universal financial address to transfer money it has scaled up and and uh, the aadhaar enabled delivery systems need to be de deployed ubiquitously and of course uh, we need to build you know we need to use this digital footprint data for for probably many you know algorithms and ai and other kinds of stuff and of course accelerating the speed of deployment for applications not so much uh, for now that the aadhaar generation is complete we need to you know think of more and more applications and i think uh, this this actually has has uh, uh, happened but we need to accelerate it further in a number of other areas so that's all uh, friends i have to say i think i've been able to yeah, maintain the time uh thank you very much now i'm open for questions or uh... yeah well thank you so much dr sharma and uh, this was an excellent discussion of this incredibly important project so before asking a few questions let me remind everybody in the audience that they can go to the q and a button at the bottom of the uh, website that you're looking at and add your questions and we will try to get to as many of them as we have time. Dr. Sharma, uh, two weeks ago, I attended a FinTech conference in Mexico and one of the biggest challenges of many of the startups that I heard present is that they're trying to go after financial inclusiveness, but you know, in Mexico, less than 50% of the population has banking relationships, so they struggle with how to authenticate the potential clients of their services, and as you said, classic KYC is way too expensive. Now, what I have heard is because of Adhar, this is no longer a problem in India, and you have pure digital banking, you have pure digital services that include everybody in the country from the lowest levels of uh, income to the highest. Can you tell us something about the use of Adhar for digital payments, digital money, and inclusiveness? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it is very, very important because if you remember the slide which I presented on Jan, the first thing was Janadhan, the J. And Janadhan uh, it literally stands for people's money. Jan is, Jan is people and Dhan is money. So it's people's money. And this is something you know, which our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Modi, sort of uh, espoused, saying that look, this is people's money. And you know, bankers typically used to say, no, nobody wants to open a bank account you know it's not the question of uh, the supply it's a question of demand there's no demand but once it became easy for the banker because bankers were actually realizing that if the cost of opening a bank account was two dollars and the total money which was coming into the system was just about a dollar mm. then why should, why should a banker open a bank account it was not it was not you know so ultimately it's related to the cost of in you know cost of subscription Put it this way to a system, 
and cost of subsequent transactions. So if the cost of one transaction, for example, if I draw money from ATM and if my cost of transaction is, let's say, a dollar, then if I draw 50 cents, it doesn't make any sense. So bankers were losing money and bankers therefore were not interested in doing this business. So two things happened. At a regulatory front, the Reserve Bank of India gave license. You know, we came up with the concept of what is called differentiated banking, which means all banks don't have to do everything, which they don't have to do credit and other kinds of stuff. So mm -hmm. then there are something called payment banks. So we, we actually gave license to 24 or 27 payments bank in a span of two years, which means their job is only to do payment. And we also told them, be digital. Don't be, you know, paper-based because paper-based you will not be able to survive. So what happened was then it became extremely easy because it became paperless to open a bank account. In fact, theoretically, believe me, I sitting here using my laptop or using my computer, I can open a bank account because I can put, pull up what is called customer acquisition form, digitally sign it and ask you know, the UID authority of India to you know, give the KYC to the bank after I authenticate. So KYC to the bank goes, the digitally signed customer acquisition form goes to the bank and the bank opens the bank account because that's what it needs. So essentially the, the, the magic was to, to A, provide identity to everybody, a digital identity, and then secondly, to ensure that cost of subscription becomes very low for the banks. And thirdly, to ensure that the cost of transactions also becomes extremely low. So today we have a system whereby the digital transaction, and mind you, many countries in, in the world have developed what they call silo systems. So for example, Kenya developed m -Pisa. It's a great innovation. I'm not so saying that it's a bad thing, but what has happened is it can only communicate, you know, I can transfer money to another m -Pisa customer, not, not to everybody. So by having an interoperable framework, we now ensure that whether you are in bank A or bank B or bank C, you are able to interoperably transfer. So that was another innovation. So digital ID, digital KYC, and the unified payment interface all put together and use of mobile as a proxy identity. It all, you know, today what's happening, the, the Prime Minister of India launched this UPI and, and we launched what is called a reference application called Bheem, Bharat Interface for Money. And using that protocol today, Google, WhatsApp, a number of companies, I think there are about 50 or 100 companies which have developed applications and which people are you know, using and interoperably transferring money. Now Google's page can trans transfer money to Bheem. So any application to any application, any bank to any bank, that's the match. And now the cost of transaction is nothing. You know, it's just one entry into the database from where I'm transferring money, one entry to the database where I'm transferring money to, and the, you know, the settlement authority called NPCI, and that's all. So that's the, that's the way it has to be built, actually. Yeah, so that, that's very impressive. So <coughs> let me just ask you to cl clarify. So if there is a poor person and let's say she's getting a government remittance, social service remittance from the government, without her, that goes straight in her digital account. And if she now wants to spend it by groceries, the grocery is able to accept the digital payment, correct? And, if, right. and what if she wants to get some cash out? Uh, where can she go to get some of that electronic money in cash for whatever she may need? Are there places See, all over the country that will do that? Yeah. As, you, as, as I explained to you, if you want to get a cash out, the, typically the cost is very high. Cost to the banking system, cost yeah. to the individual because the number of bank branches, let's say we have about 200,000 bank branches, but these bank branches, I, I not, no, they are not accessible. So what we have done is we have opened, you know, we have, India has got 600,000 villages, 600,000. Mm -hmm. wow. And we have 250,000 panchayats. Panchayats are actually the lowest level of democracy. 
you know, mm-hmm. elected guys are there and stuff like that. So every two and a half villages on an average has a panchayat. And in every panchayat, we have something called a common service center. This common service center is managed by a village level entrepreneur who provides all kinds of digital services. Because let's also remember that while we are going to have 500 million smartphones, even then it is 50% of the total population, 50% of the, let's say 1 billion is phones. So there are 50, 50, 500 million feature phones also where you cannot do digital transactions, of course, through the, the UP, you know, that, mm-hmm. uh, uh, whatever, USP or whatever it is called. So, so essentially, essentially uh, what happens is that this cash out part is done at the village level mm-hmm. through the village level entrepreneur. Of course, cash out part can also be done with the guy who is actually doing the digital because typically grocery shop owner will be interested in attracting the customer. So suppose I go and I buy, I pay him 100 rupees in, in digital part. I buy 50 rupees worth of goods. He may probably give me 50 rupees, you know, in cash also. So, so because, because it's, it, it, it's, you know, ubiquitous in some sense, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't mandate that only, only bank should deliver the cash or only ATM should deliver the cash. Mm-hmm. And the amount is pretty small. The amount is very, very small. You must understand that the, the average transaction size of the UPI transaction is about $10. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now that, that's very impressive. Uh, let me ask you one of the questions we got from our audience. Uh, Kola Akintola asked, how did Adhar get the Indian government's buy-in into the program? So how did this happen? No, let me put it this way. Aadhaar is a government project. Aadhaar is not a private project. So, so it's actually, it was started by the government. It has been with the government. It's a government system. Only thing is we collected together a set of experts and, you know, initial, initial people who were technology uh, evangelists and, and stuff like that. And that's how we built it. But it's a, it's a public good. It's a public artifact. It's not a private uh, stuff. Okay, very good. So that leads me to the second question by Ayobami Oladejo, which is often governments, when they want to do a program like this, bring in very expensive consultants that don't know much about, I don't know, the, the conditions to advise them what to do. How did India, how was India able to do this with such a solution so well designed for India? Who, who were your consultants and experts that said, Dr. Sharma, this is what will work, this is what will not work? How did you do it? It's an extremely interesting question because typically I have been in the public space for about 40 years now. Yes. Smart of this year I completed 40 years and I joined at the age of 22. Now, you know, the consultants have become the ubiquitous kind of fellows. Everybody wants to hire a consultant to prepare some report and then, you know, go about it. Right. We we did not go that consultant route. In fact, we did not have any consultant whatsoever. Mm -hmm. However, we actually decided that this project cannot be done with, without the, you know, with, with bureaucrats alone, the guys who don't understand technology. Mm-hmm. This project also cannot be done by complete technologists who don't understand public policy or who don't understand ground realities. So the only way this project can be done where you combine the efficiency of the private sector and the, you know, knowledge, domain knowledge of the public sector. So, so what happened, this project was headed by Mr. Nandan Nilekani, he was the chief of the Infos, Infosys. In fact, he is the chairman of Infosys uh, now, and, okay. and many people are not employing them. He employed him. He was the chairman of this this uh, project. Mm-hmm. I was the director general and mission director, so I was number two in some sense. Mm-hmm. Then we collected together a team of technology people, and mm-hmm. we, you know we got volunteers, we got sabbatical fellows, and we got all kinds of you know people, and we also hired consultants, but we did not hire, we did not hire agency which would provide us consultant. 
we hired the consultant directly from the market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they made them a part of the team so this way it was a team and it was a very thin team let me put it this way the total number of people was about 250 all told which is the field fellows the you know the uh, private fellows the technology mm -hmm. people and and that's how we built because we mm -hmm. realized and, and you know uh, let's also understand that we began, I joined, for example, Nandan joined the UIDI on 24th of July, 2009. I joined a week later, but the first number was issued on in the month of September, 2010. So it mm. took us three months to actually design an architect and make pilots and other kinds of preparations, rights, enrollment softwares, you know, hire some of these, of course, we did hire the biometric deduplication agencies because we there's no open source biometric deduplication technology mm -hmm. available. But mm -hmm. we had another interesting thing, we hired three of them and we hired in such a manner that if one of them doesn't work, we just unplug him and plug in another one. And we did that in fact going forward. So essentially we, we were very conscious there shall be no vendor lock-in. Excellent. And therefore whosoever comes in, we should have a plug and play kind of a structure. We did not have any equipment locking also. For example, the enrollment equipment could be of any brand. So long mm -hmm. as it sets a certain minimum criteria, it's fine with us. So mm -hmm. essentially, this was, the, this was the thought process. And I think there was nothing secret. So that's why I'm able to you know, talk about this in a very open manner. Because we don't have anything you know, proprietary or secret about it except the biometric duplication. So that's yeah. why I always believe that India is ready to share this because once we have done it, we will be very happy. And tell, let me tell you, you know, this is one of the most cost effective stuff you can do and you can improve your entire public service delivery system. Today, yeah. R is at the center of India's public service delivery reforms and systems. So, Dr. Sharma, that leads me to a very important question. You said you're now ready to share your experiences with the rest of the world. Now, in the US, we've been struggling with the issue of identity management and authentication. I know you know the US because you, you, you got a master's at UC Riverside. So what advice would you give us in the US at this point? Well, uh, let, me, let me be very uh, frank, and I, I don't know whether you like this or not. No, please, please this be way, very frank. My, my sense is, look, Aadhaar is not for every country in the world, or Aadhaar type of structure is not for everybody. You must have a problem to solve. For example, we had the problem of people without any identity document. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether the problem is so you know, big, in US or in Western Europe or in many other developed countries. The developed nations who actually have start uh, having, for example, you have national identification number in Britain, you have other numbers. So, so broadly, everybody's counted there in some sense. So unless you are having people who are below the radar or who don't have identity, you really don't have that problem. Similarly, we had the problem of huge leakages taking place because of the duplicates and costs. And I'm not sure whether you have that kind of massive problem in the United States. So my sense is that unless you have a problem to solve, you should not try to solve it. I mean, you I, should not try to I, solve it. Dr. Sharma, let me ask you, um, and, and then I'll get, I want to ask you about healthcare in a second, but let me follow up on my question. Let's say in the US, the number of people without banking affiliations I don't know, it's maybe 15% or so. However, cybersecurity is a gigantic issue. And, and, you know, based on my work at MIT and other places, security and identity are closely intertwined, correct? So, so we may not have quite the inclusiveness issue but we have a gigantic cybersecurity issue. Can you just say a few words about Adhar 
and its application to cybersecurity. And next, I want to ask you about Adhar and its application to improve access to healthcare. Okay, so first cybersecurity, then access to healthcare, if you may. No, I, I fully agree with you that cybersecurity is an extremely, extremely important threat and one has to be extremely conscious of it. So what we have done is, A, we have taken all these steps, and of course we continue to take all the stops, the steps to secure Aadhaar database. That's one part because that's in our in our domain. So, so one is that we have a fraud management system at the back end because a huge number of authentications are taking place every second. So we are having those systems as to, you know, if somebody is authenticating from place X and next moment he authenticates from place Y and X and Y are so distinct that the guy cannot be at two places at the same time. Then you know we, we kind of catch him. So so those systems are being deployed. Number one. Number two, we are using encryptions and other kinds of policies. So when you enroll for Aadhaar, your data gets encrypted. In the last eight or nine years that Aadhaar has been in existence, there has not been a single instance of any biometric data having been leaked. And we well, don't use that. We keep the biometric data offline, which means at the back end when authentication takes place, it's actually the minutiae of the, fe of the features of these biometrics which are participating in this, this authentication and not the biometric itself, number one. Number two, we have that yes and no system. You, you know, if your authentication, if your either, either the authentication response is yes or it is no, we don't disclose any information. So many of these uh, you know, security and privacy aspects have been built, it, built in into the design of the project. So that's one part. I agree with you that other domains have to be careful, other domains which interface with Aadhaar. Aadhaar has insulated itself in the sense that the interface with the other domains is only through a well-defined protocol and we don't get more information than what is required and we don't disclose information than what is not required by them. So that essentially, authentication as a service. So, so we don't, for example, know what is the purpose of the authentication? And that's, that actually ensures privacy because oh. it's a structure. Also, you provide, excuse me, the Adhar service provides to the private sector authentication as a service. Is that correct? Yes, it does. That's very impressive. That I am very impressed. I don't want to run out of time to ask you this very important question from Matthew Rees, which is if you can talk about how Adhar will or already is being used to improve access to healthcare in India. Well, uh, I think what is happening is that the, there are a number of healthcare schemes which provide subsidies or help uh, to the poor people. So essentially at that point, if you are eligible, then when you go to a hospital, in order to ensure that only you get the service and nobody else proxies for you, the Aadhaar authentication is used. So essentially Aadhaar can provide service to any domain which is interested in identity verification and authentication. Health is one such domain and to, in fact, a couple of months back, our Prime Minister, our Prime Minister has launched a very, very massive program, uh, virtually covering about half the population of India into universal kind of health coverage, which is called Ayushman Bharat. And there we are developing what we call India Health Stack. And I can probably forward that document to you, essentially as to what will be the health stack, what will be the diagnostics, the service providers, and how do you create a registry of that. So that of course is, not directly related to Aadhaar because Aadhaar provides only authentication services, but we have built similar to Aadhaar, similar to UPI, we have built what is called India Health Stack. So, so that describes various uh, health related uh, technology artifacts and components. Excellent. Chris, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Irving. And Dr. Sharma, thank you very much for your time and excellent presentation. I have two questions. One is you chose to make Adhar voluntary. 
I would like to know what were the pluses, the benefits and the drawbacks of that decision of making ADHAR voluntary as opposed to mandatory. And, and tell me about the Supreme Court's decision. Are there things that you were doing last week with ADHAR that you, based upon the decision, will no longer be able to do next week? I think these are excellent questions, Chris. And I, I, let me first uh, uh, tell to this, this issue of voluntary versus mandatory. So we issued a broad strategy paper uh, as long back as in August of 2009, whereby we called, you know, creating unique identity for a billion Indians. And there we deliberately said that if, you know, because it's an identity without eligibility. So if, if that means identity, which does not provide any kind of, you know, assurances, what you will get, what you will not get. So we said, look, if you make it compulsory or if you make it mandatory, this will be, you know, this will not be acceptable to the people. So let those people come first who don't have any ID papers and who need identity. Let people come and, you know, get this document. Otherwise, you know, if you, if you do this mandatory business, then what will happen is that, you know, you, you have to have the approximate facilities to do that. And, you know, you have to have a timetable to complete that. Anybody who's not there, you will have to punish it. You will have to notice him and all that stuff. So, so we didn't want to get into that route. However, in the document, we have said that while Aadhaar is voluntary, if any domain, for example, any subsidy delivering agency, if it wants to make it compulsory for their own domain, they may do so at their own convenience and time, which means that suppose I've got 100 beneficiaries and if 95 of them already has Aadhaar number, then I can say, look, I will provide you, you know, these services only after verification of your identity. The, those five guys who don't have the IDs, please, you know, get yourself registered. So you don't go to the entire mandatory stuff for the entire population you can actually keep on mandating it from domain to domain, from sector to sector, from department to department. So that's one part. Secondly, the question, you know, we are still studying that, that judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court, which actually came last, uh, uh, you know, about 24 hours back, that judgment runs into 1500 pages, 1448 to be more precise. And, and there's a dissenting judgment. So one judgment is four judges, uh, you know, Three judges, one judgment, one judge, another judgment, which concurs with these three judges, and the fifth judge is, is dissented. So all these we are studying, but broad part is, there's a section in the Aadhaar Act called section 57, which actually says that it can be used by corporate and private entities. And you know, you asked that question just now that whether Aadhaar is being used for private, but private entities or not. And I answered that in yes, but there is some doubt now because whether the private entities can insist on Aadhaar, A, and whether they can use the authentication service of Aadhaar is another question. However, the Supreme Court has left a caveat saying that if the government thinks that these entities should use Aadhaar, government can actually incorporate that in the law. So for example, you know, income tax, there is the money laundering act and income tax, uh, you know, says that we should use Aadhaar and, and therefore that is covered. So that is exempted. But banking, for example, banking may be there's no regulation or there's no rule which says that you should mandatorily verify your identity through Aadhaar. So maybe they will have to put in some regulation. So essential idea is that each sector regulator or each department will have to ensure that they have a proper legal backing to actually utilize the system. That's the difference which has happened. And I'm sure the government is cognizant of the fact because Today itself, I am a telecom regulator and my telecom companies are now saying, look, our cost of customer acquisition will go 10 times because currently we are acquiring a customer at just about two, three, two, two, three cents, US cents. And tomorrow our customer acquisition cost will become $2. So it is, it is going to be huge. So now, you know, what do we do? Because today they are using electronic KYC. Tomorrow they will use those, the paper documents. So, so I think, uh, you know, we are still studying the judgment. And there are certain sectors for which we already have the law. There may be certain sectors for which we don't have the law or regulation. Law does not mean a law enacted by parliament. Law also means subordinate legislation by the regulators, uh, like, like TRAI. 
So I think that's that's what it is. But it's, it's too early, really, to give a definitive answer to your question because we are still studying the judgment. But we are very sure whatever the judgment is, because the judgment very clearly says that you can have, you can do this with the legal backing, and that I think sectors will be able to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Dr. Shomer, I want to thank you as well. We've run out of time. Uh, we really appreciate this. this. was a fascinating presentation. And I want to remind uh, our viewers that you can download the recording uh, on our uh, CGE YouTube channel. And uh, I know there's been a request for some uh, copies of the slides. So uh, we will send them out if that's OK with you. To, uh, yeah, that's, okay. that's OK with me. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, friends. It has been wonderful uh, talking to you, and you know, sort of, I, 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 I feel so passionately about this project and, and 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 what it has done to the country, and therefore I feel a pleasure in you know kind of sharing this with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye bye.